Welcome to the British Library and to the chase of the wild goose. It's such a thrill to uncover the missing histories of our pioneering women and queer icons from the past. And tonight we're doing just that. You will meet the amazing Mary Gordon and the subjects of her writing, Eleanor Butler and Sarah Ponsonby, uh, in the newly republished by Lurid Editions, um, which is available right here. If you look on the link beneath, you can, you can just treat yourself straight away to this incredible book. Uh, we've got people joining from all over the world tonight, even as far away as New Zealand. So welcome to all our friends. Please join in with your questions and comments. Um, you can drop them in any time in the, the box below. We absolutely love hearing from you. Um, and there's time set aside at the end for your questions. Can I also draw your attention to the donate button in case you feel that you'd like to support the British Library in sharing even more of its goodness. So let's crack on with a special welcome to our magnificent chair, Noreena Shopland, who's an LGBTQ plus historian, whose published works include A History of Women in Men's Clothes and Forbidden Lives, LGBT Stories from Wales. Noreena, Kroiso and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's lovely to be here this evening. Really looking forward to the discussions. Got lots of really interesting questions, but um, as you said, please, if you have do, if you have any questions yourself, uh, pop them in the box. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to have the three speakers introduce themselves, and then we're going to have um, a series of questions uh, which all of them will answer. So uh, to kick off, uh, DM, would you like to do a brief introduction, please? Yeah, for sure. Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be here. And um, thank you for that introduction to the evening to be and to Narina. Um, so my name is DM Withers. I'm the publisher of Lurid Editions. I'm also a lecturer in publishing at the University of Exeter. So Lurid Editions is essentially part of my, my research practice. And I've also done a lot of research archival research on the history of um, the Virago modern classics. So I'm very interested in the cultural dynamics of recovery and reclaiming forgotten texts, forgotten voices, and resituating them and repositioning them in the marketplace. So Lurid is, is part of that project, and I'm particularly overjoyed that this is the first title that we've published because it's such a great book, such a joyful book. It's a book that I've seen already has brought so much happiness to people um, because of its its joyfulness because it's you know really a celebration of one of the greatest queer love stories of all time so it's great to be here to be discussing it with Francis Bingham and Alison Oram and Norena as well who are all experts in the different dimensions of this amazing story. Thank you very much. Um, Alison please. Hello, yeah, I'm, my name's Alison Oram and I'm very, I'm delighted to be on this panel because the ladies of Van Gothlin have been, a, you know, of interest to me for decades, I guess. Um, I'm historian of lesbian, queer and LGBTQ history, um, mainly in an academic setting. Um, I'm currently a research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research in London, and I used to work at Leeds Beckett University, where I was professor of social and cultural history. And I've um, published quite a lot, really, on lesbian history and queer history, including, well, <laughs> including lesbian history source book and... Her husband was a woman, which was published back in 2007, and most recently, Queer Beyond London with Matt Cook. Um, and over the last ooh, 20 years, 15 to 20 years, I've become increasingly interested in queer heritage, you know, the buildings and the places which, which um, uh, are resonant with, with, with queer histories. And so I've been visiting Plasnewith and Ada's home since well at least the 1990s and I've written about it and about other lesbian and, and queer places not only kind of elite historic houses but also everyday heritage on our streets and um, you know next door and I led a project called Pride of Place with Historic England back in well a few years ago now which is still available online. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
And Frances, please. Um, yeah, I am a London-based writer, just down the road from the British Library, in fact. And my most recent book was this one, Valentine Ackland, Transgressive Life, um, which was published in 2021 from Handheld Press. And it was shortlisted for the Polari Prize and given an Authors Foundation Award, which I'm very happy about. Um, it's about the poet who was Sylvia Townsend Warner's lover. And part of my research for it involved reading the complete journals of both writers. So I've developed a great interest in journals and diaries, and I'm currently working on a book about modernist writers, journal writing. I've also recently finished a novel called Psychic Lives, which is about queer spiritualism in the 1930s. So this evening's conversation covers several of my special interests. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you're all so impressive. I, I just love your work. And I've read, um, obviously, a lot by, by both um, Alison and Francis. So um, great. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is DM. Could you tell us, first of all, um, a little bit more background to how you came to want to republish Chase the Wild Goose? What inspired you? And can you outline some of the difficulties you've experienced and some of the joys? For sure. So um, really the root of uh, me republishing Chase of the Wild Goose um, was a visit to Place Naueth in, I think it was 2019. I went with some friends. We were holidaying in North Wales and I've always wanted to go to Place Naueth and, um, you know, growing up, as a queer person, you hear the words Ladies of Clangochlan, and um, I wanted to investigate more about um, who they were and to, to visit their home. So it was a beautiful sunny day um, in the middle of August, and we, we turned up at Place Naueth and were just utterly, utterly enchanted by the place. Um, indeed, perhaps had a Mary Gordon-esque experience of, of being kind of lightly haunted in a very positive way by the spirit of the ladies um, we marvelled at the, the gothic carvings in the house, um, the, the perfume, the, the bottles to perfume the carpet, um, the, the oil painting of Tatters and her kittens, um, the oil painting of the cats of the ladies of Clangochlan. So this whole myth about them being, um, or this question of whether or not they were, they were queer or, or lesbians or whatever. And then you see the oil painting of the cats and the kittens and it's just, it's unquestionable. It's just, you know. Um, so, and we also uh, walked around what the ladies of Langochland called the, the home circuit, which is the beautiful gardens and the, the little the stream. It's not a little stream. It's actually quite a big, a big water. I don't know what it is. It's like a, a water feature in their garden. And we walked around it. It was such a peaceful, restorative, healing, inspiring, wondrous experience. And when I returned back to my life in, in Bristol, kind of just became a bit obsessed on a low level with the ladies of Clangochlan and started to look around, see what was written about them. And I found Mary Gordon's book. And um, I think lockdown happened, um, you know, the pandemic happened uh, as soon after, but um, I managed to get a copy of Chase of the Wild Goose, uh, the Hogarth Press edition, because it was first published by the Hogarth Press, Leonard and Virginia Woolf's Hogarth Press in 1936. I got hold of a, a second edition of the of the of the of the book, so it was it went into a second print run. The first print run was around two thousand copies, and then it was successful enough and sold well enough to, to have another print run. So I was sat there, kind of gobbling up this this wonderful story, um, feeling really happy because it's a happy book, it's a fun book, it's a bit like a bit like reading fan fiction. Mary Gordon is is a fan of the ladies of Clan Gochler, and she gives them these these fantastic and fantastic voices and this this fantasy of their voices she you know she imagined them as these wonderful kind of butch superstars um I think um in in places um so it was just really wonderful to read that story and I couldn't believe it was it was out of print um and I, I sat there and I just thought well um I've done a lot of this research around the Virago modern classics and um had done some publishing in the past and I suppose I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe I should reprint it. And then as time went on, um, I just decided to set up a publishing company and the idea of Lurid Editions came to me. Um, again, it partly inspired by 
um, my research in Virago um, and book history. So thinking about the, um, if you haven't seen the books, um, they're here, actually it's a bit blurry. They've got a very strong color profile to them, they're fuchsia. So I was thinking about the history of, of, of successful publishing companies and all and publishing series, and they all have a very strong color profile. If you think about Penguin with the orange covers, um, Heinemann African Writer series also had orange covers. The contemporary Fitzcarraldo editions with their lovely blue covers. And this is, you know, I will be honest, it is a ripoff of, of the, the Fitzcarraldo. It's an appropriation. All publishing is a is a is a is a constant appropriation of the design decisions that have preceded it. So I'm, you know, I, I, I will make no um no apology for, for that act of appropriation. But I thought the one colour that hasn't really been done in a uniform way is fuchsia. So I like fuchsia, so that's that's the reason um, behind that. And, and all lurid books will have lovely fuchsia covers. So, so there was a design concept and a publishing concept that, that came to me quite vividly, actually, at the same time. And, um, you know, the wheels just kind of went in motion and um, I, it just didn't just happen, but it kind of it kind of just did happen. Um, and then I, I set up Lurid as a company and um, and then sort of last year I did get the job at Exeter and kind of framed it as part of my, my publishing practice, my research practice, so to speak, which it is. Um, and um, yeah, so I went from there in terms of um, what was it, the, the pleasures and the challenges? Was that, that the question, Narina, the, the challenges of it? The difficulties and the, the joys, I think I put it. <laughs> the difficulties and the joys. Um, haven't really faced any difficulties thus far. It's been a pretty smooth run, um, to be honest, and um, with this particular book. So um, it's been it's been overwhelmingly frictionless, um, I would say. I had it's a very easy in a way, it's it's not an easy book to situate in the marketplace, but I was just I was just really lucky that because I had worked at the British Library as well, I, I was able to ask, you know, people um, for help with getting things like blurbs, like Sarah Waters, for example, has written a lovely blurb for the for the front cover. Um, so I just, I pulled out a lot of favours, asked a lot of people, and they they kind of responded very positively. So it's, sometimes it's like that with pod projects, isn't it? Where people, they you sort of ask people to do things and they know what it is, and they just they just say yes, because it's it's a positive force in the world. And that's really what it's been like for, for this particular um this particular book it's been it's just been really successful and you know good um so i'm sure there'll be challenges in the future um undoubtedly um but i think you know maybe the ladies were tapping on my shoulder when i was uh when i was at plas and they they needed a bit of they needed to be revived or something in this moment their story needed to be given a bit of a signal boost who knows Great, thank you very much. It's good to hear that um, so far it's been smooth running. Brilliant. Um, Alison, if we could turn to you, please. Can you tell us a bit more about the ladies as lesbian icons and symbols of love between women, uh, who they were and how others saw them? <laughs> OK, well, this could uh, take an evening, but um, yeah, I mean, the ladies were actually Irish. Um, although obviously they've been really strongly associated with Langothlin and Wales for, well, ever since they moved there. They, um, Lady Eleanor Butler was from the Irish aristocracy. Sarah Ponsonby was also from an elite background. They met when Sarah was 13 and Eleanor was 29. So there was quite an age gap, um, fell in love, formed a deep affection for each other met when they could, wrote to each other, and by all accounts their their um their bond was based on books and conversation and talking about ideas and so on. Um, Ten years later, in 1778, they tried to run away together, the first time disguised in men's clothes and with the help of a couple of servants, but they were caught and brought home. Now, there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of bitter words around their relationship with their families, because obviously it was a terrible scandal that they just tried to do this. But um, eventually their families agreed to let them go in a kind of respectable fashion. So they traveled together to Wales a few months later, 
and um, travelled around Wales for a few months and then found the cottage which is on the edge of the town of Flangothlin and lived there from 1780 for 50 years until their deaths in 1829 for Eleanor Butler and 1831 for Sarah Ponsonby. But eloping, you know, eloping as two women together was very dramatic. I mean, it was an, um, um, something which drew attention to them and their families. And, you know, it was a very strong statement of their desire to live together. So, you know, in themselves, they're, they're, they are of such importance. And, um, yeah, it's hardly surprising that they became lesbian and queer icons. So what they did in Wales was they, they lived out a version of rural romanticism, which was at that point very fashionable, which supposedly involved rejecting worldly society and living the late 18th century version of the simple life devoted to their garden, their animals, their friends, their books, and self-improvement, really, uh, learning foreign languages and so on. By the standards of their own class, they didn't have much money, although they always had one or two at least um, servants, but they did work their aristocratic connections and, and got pensions from various people, tried to sort of leverage money out of their families and gradually became, you know, a bit more comfortably off. What's important about the ladies is that they become celebrities in their own lifetimes. I mean, they really do. They were visited by friends and acquaintances, a lot of them from aristocratic, even royal families um, and literary visitors. So they and they were written about in society magazines of the era. And um, and, you know, yeah, their lifestyle resonated with this idea of romanticism. And as North Wales as a region became part of a kind of genteel tourist trail because it's you know very beautiful and it was kind of opening up there um and it was on the the route to I to the fact to get the ferry to go to Ireland so they were not actually retiring from society society came to visit them over the years um I could give you a list of famous people who visited them, the Duke of Wellington, William Wordsworth, who later on wrote a poem about them, Josiah Wedgwood, the poet Anna Seward, um, so on, and many, many others. And even before, even within their own lifetimes, there were there was um, a pottery dinner service or two created named after the ladies of Flangothlin. And certainly by the mid 19th century, after their deaths, you could buy um, figurines of them. You could buy all sorts of tourist um, souvenirs of the ladies of Flangothlin. Um, so how were they seen by others? Well. They, they were certainly seen by many people as eccentric, um, but because it was described as romantic friendship, their, their partnership was maybe just about socially acceptable. And it was certainly cemented as such by the fact that, you know, their visitors included the great and the good. And of course, in terms of social hierarchy, they were the most elite people living in the neighbourhood. So that also protected them to some extent from negative commentary, although they did come in for ridicule and negative commentary from some people. But then on the other hand, they had a lot of admirers and supporters. Um, there was a sort of libelous attack on them in 1790, the famous General Evening Post article, which suggested that they had ref refused marriage in order to elope together and also described Eleanor as being the masculine one and Sarah Ponsonby as being the, 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 the feminine, the, you know, taking the feminine role in the household. And that's too many people sort of suggested a certain degree of perverse perversity. Um, and the ladies were really, really cross about it and threatened to sue for libel they didn't in fact and their friends kind of rallied around and said oh look it'll blow over which which it did um I mean the concept of sex between women was certainly around in the 18th century I mean <laughs> you know when when has it not been but it's you know who knows what when and how is it named and how 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 are women couples talked about certainly not named as such in polite society 
But the diarist, author and gossip, Hester Thrail Piozzi, described the lady, she was quite fascinated by lesbians. She described the society women as Bath, as the unclean birds of Bath or something like similar to praise to that. And she described the ladies in an unpublished diary as, quote, Dan Saphists. Um, so, you know, some people did associate them with the idea of sex between women. But I mean, you know, we have to, 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 to also say that, you know, that diary wasn't ever published and was only kind of discovered, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, um, but at least by historians. So that's a bit different from aspersions being cast on them in, you know, the public print media. So generally they're accepted as a same sex couple in this in this notion, contemporary notion of romantic friendship. Um, but what I'm really interested in about the ladies is their is the way that they become icons of love between women and how women project their dreams and desires onto them, particularly the ideal of having a kind of continuing, long-lasting domestic partnership with another woman. Um, I'll mention a couple of early 19th century um, examples which show kind of different versions you know how they the, how the how you know there are different versions of this already in their own lifetimes the poet Anna Seward who became a friend of theirs from the mid 1890s and who wrote several poems about them she was um very taken with the ladies and yeah she was quite a um an important um friend and um yeah, uh, letter writer and, and promote, promoter of them in a sense. She herself had had an intense and passionate attachment to her friend Honora Snaid. I can never quite say that name, but an another young woman, but, and had lived with her for a bit, but felt, you know, incredibly betrayed when Honora married and left her. So for Anna Seward, the ladies were role models, you know, they'd achieved what she couldn't achieve, which was this lifelong female partnership in life, um, not just in letters or not just in aspiration. On the other hand, an, another of their callers much later on was the um, diarist who everybody knows of now, Anne Lister, or Gentleman Jack, as the TV series has her. Anne Lister was of a generation below, in, in age, in a generation below um, the ladies, and also socially sort of below them. She was, she was from the Halifax gentry um, and was very sort of socially aspirational. And we know, of course, through her diaries, that Anne Lister herself had a series of sexual relationships with women lovers and you know which were very colorful and um which you know she managed to live her life um with well certainly the the Anne Walker whom she um did live with for the last uh, few years of her life at Shipton Hall near Halifax anyway after reading about the ladies partnership earlier on Anne Lister visited Plasnewith in 1822 and met Sarah Ponsonby, who was quite elderly by then. Anne Lister was building her own identity as a woman who loved only the fairer sex, in her own words. And she speculated in letters to her lover about whether the lady's love for each other was the same kind as her own, writing, I cannot help thinking that surely it was not platonic. Heaven forgive me, but I look within myself and doubt. So here we've got Anne Lister kind of imagining this idealized sexual relationship that also has a lot of has longevity and commitment and passion. She asks them, you know, whether they ever have little quarrels. Um, and they and Sarah says, well, not really, which is probably a bit of an exaggeration. Um, so again, Anne Lister sort of seeking something through the ladies. And her lover at the time, Marianne Lawton, was a married woman. And that relationship, although it had got, persisted for many, many, many years, was ultimately unsuccessful. And it was only later in the 1830s that um, Anne Lister settled down with Anne Walker. So in the 19th century, women kind of had these 
different visions of her and yeah so we can leap on to Mary Gordon <laughs> in the 1930s um and yeah there were other examples as well kind of in between I mean I can say something about Mary Gordon unless um, can we come else? back to Mary Gordon a bit yeah. later yeah. well thank you very much indeed that that's great and I mean of all the stuff you were saying, oh, well, I kept thinking of all the questions I wanted to ask and follow up bits and, you know, particularly about the, the, the sort of the whole thing between romantic friendships and same sex relationships, but maybe we can fit that in later on. Um, so thank you for, uh, for that, Alison. Uh, Frances, can you put the chase into context as lesbian queer modernist text uh, when it was published in the 1930s, please? Yes, well, <clears throat> one thing about the 1930s, the key fact you have to remember is that the 1920s came first. And in 1928, the publication of Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness and Virginia Woolf's Orlando are very important in the context of publication by the Hogarth Press. And unlike Orlando, the well really shows its age now, but it outraged the establishment then, I think, particularly because it was written in a popular form. It really queered the romantic novel and its melodrama and lack of subtlety place it within that period genre. So it's like in the Lady Chatterley trial when the prosecuting counsel said, would you want your wife or your servant to read this book? Or the Sunday Express saying that they would prefer the famous quote, give a healthy boy or a healthy girl prussic acid rather than the well of loneliness. Um, this moral panic is because of the accessibility of the book. And it was a polemic, a book with a mission demanding social change, understanding and acceptance of inverts. And the unhappy ending, the self-hatred of the protagonist, Stephen, are all considered authorial strategies to gain the reader's sympathy. And this is a big contrast to lesbian characters during the gay 20s, who are very often the stock character of the mannish predatory lesbian with a capital L, um, which is never sympathetic. I'm thinking about Rosamond Lehman's Dusty Answer, The Tortoiseshell Cat by Naomi Royd Smith, Extraordinary Women by Compton Mackenzie, Elizabeth Bowen's The Hotel, which is a bit less hostile, but a very gloomy picture overall. And the Wells notorious obscenity trial culminated with the book being burnt in the furnaces down in the cellars of Scotland Yard, which is a very British form of book burning. But um, it created a very hostile environment for any positive portrayal of inverts. Uh, I think it's worth remembering here that in 1921, there was a motion in Parliament to criminalise lesbian acts between women in the same way that male homosexuality was illegal. And the Lords voted not to put it on the statute book because it would acquaint women who'd never otherwise hear about it with this evil practice. And of course, the obscenity trial did that and more. After that, publishers had to be more cautious, but there was a paradox in which the censorship had actually created the very publicity and public interest which the trial had aimed to repress. And Virginia Woolf referred to the self-censorship which in future writers might have to practice in a room of one's own. And I'm gonna read this bit that's from one version of it. Um, Chloe liked Olivia. They shared a, the words came at the bottom of the page. The pages had stuck while fumbling to open them. There flashed into my mind, the inevitable policeman, the summons, the order to attend the court, the dreary waiting, the magistrate coming in with a little bow, the glass of water, the counsel for the prosecution, for the defense, the verdict, this book is obscene. And flames rising, perhaps on Tower Hill, as they consumed masses of paper. Here the pages came apart. Heaven be praised. It was only a laboratory they shared. Um, and she also um, was very disrespectful in letters she wrote to the Home Secretary in protest. 
Um, the subject of the book exists as a fact among the many other facts of life. Novelists in England have now been forbidden to mention it by Sir W. Johnson Hicks. May they mention it incidentally? Although it's forbidden as a main theme, may it be alluded to or ascribed to subsidiary characters? Perhaps the Home Secretary will issue further orders on this point. So despite her scorn for this censorship, although it was a book she didn't rate particularly highly, as a publisher, Virginia Woolf would have had to take it into consideration in 1936. So it's an important element of the immediate context. As for Orlando, surely the greatest modernist queer text, which was also published in 1928, it didn't suffer the same fate. Ironically, because arguably it's more explicit than the well. But as the literary fantasy, rather than a middle-brow romantic novel. It wasn't perceived as a threat to social order in the same way. And also I think it's not so much that it's coded, but that it's so multifaceted and coruscating that it would be very difficult to pin it down to a legal definition of obscenity. Um, I also suspect that the establishment might consider that anyone who could read a book like that was probably lost to conventional morality anyway. Um, certainly one possibility, I feel. Um, and I think that in The Chase of the Wild Goose, the influence of Orlando is evident in many ways. Um, the riff on the concepts of history and biography, of time itself, and perhaps even the title, um, The Wild Goose, appears on the last page of Orlando, of course. And the ladies themselves were part of the inspiration for Orlando. In her journal of the 14th of March, 1927, Virginia Woolf wrote that she was imagining a fantastical novel to be called The Jessamy Brides on the ladies of Langothlin. Sapphism is to be suggested, satire and wildness. And she later wrote in the margin, Orlando leading to the waves. So in 1927, the ladies were already a shorthand for Wolf and a catalyst for her imagination. Um, and during the 20s, extracts from the diary had been published in Arthur Ponsonby's English diary anthologies. And of course, Virginia Woolf would have known all about the 19th century fan base for them and Wordsworth sonnets and other references from earlier eras. But the publication of the Hamwood Papers in 1930 really brought the ladies into the modern age. I've got a nice first edition of it here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, but you can see it's a, it's a damn fat book. And um, it was published by Macmillan, so quite mainstream, edited by Mrs. G. H. Bell. And it tells the story of the ladies in a mix of letters and diaries, other diaries from the period, lots of extracts from Eleanor Butler's diary and a linking narrative. And this text really brought the ladies into the contemporary consciousness. Um, it obviously inspired Mary Gordon um, as much by what she disliked about it, I think, as what she discovered from it. Um, but in this way, the ladies even crossed the channel. Colette wrote a chapter about them in her 1932 book, C'est Plaisir. Uh, it wasn't actually published in, in English until 1968 as The Pure and the Impure. And she too asked Anne Lister's all important question, was the relationship platonic? And decided like her, probably not. Um, but Colette's work in English in the 30s is relevant to this um, because the Claudine books were being translated and including the lesbian episodes. And also Proust's In Search of Lost Time was available in translation by 1930 with its eccentric exploration of Gomorrah. Uh, but these didn't fall foul of the censors, either because they just thought the French are like that, or because they were perceived as, again, perhaps too literary to threaten the fabric of society. Closer to home, Sylvia Townsend Warner another modernist writer to whom the ladies were very important. Um, in 1930, she told her 
lover to be, Valentine Ackland, that when they shared a cottage together, they would be like the ladies of Langoslin, which I think was a very clear message as to what she was hoping and expecting their relationship would be like. And then in 1932, Sylvia's mother gave her an antique china pomade pot. I think this is one of those things you were mentioning, Alison, like, like these fan things. And it was decorated with the ladies walking out in their top hats. And Sylvia's mother said, I thought you and Miss Ackland would like this, which Sylvia interpreted as a, a spirited and affable little dig in our ribs. It was a kind of nudge, um, which I think shows that the ladies were now in the 30s sort of general shorthand for a lesbian relationship, not merely a romantic friendship or a shared cottage. And in 1936, um, Warner wrote a novel, Summer Will Show, which was described by Valentine Ackland as her lesbian novel. And it describes the intense, very close relationship which develops between Sophia Willoughby and her husband's mistress, Minna Lemuel, in 1848, revolutionary Paris. Um, but although the two women's love obviously is lesbian to today's reader, it's full of implicit sexuality. The novel avoids anything explicit and it's a political novel, feminist, communist, definitely queer, but as a historical novel, like Chase the Wild Goose, perhaps it avoided being read in that way. And in 1934, Ackland and Warner published Whether a Dove or Seagull, which was a book of joint poems that they'd both written to each other. And some of these are really explicit. They're love poems between two women, which would have surely very much displeased the Home Secretary. Um, but perhaps the publishers were relying on the fact that, like Orlando, this poetry would be incomprehensible to the authorities. Um, and as it turned out, most critics and readers presumed that Valentine was a man with that name, which slightly ignores the internal evidence of the erotic poems, um, which I think is another example of lesbian invisibility, even if the author's intent was to be seen. Um, also in 1936, same year, Juna Barnes's Nightwood was published by Faber, which is another high modernist urtext, often described as a work of genius, greatly admired by its original editor, T.S. Eliot, and now recognised as a major lesbian text. Um, and perhaps, again, the relative safety of lyricism and obscurity might have emboldened the publishers. Um, but apparently T.S. Eliot did tone down some of the lesbian episodes in order to avoid possible censorship. Uh, but what's left is something much more overt than anything in the well. Um, it tells a story of the doomed love affair of Nora Flood and Robin Vogt in 1920s Paris, which was based on Juna Barnes' obsessional love for the alcoholic sculptor Thelma Wood. Uh, and Barnes was also, of course, the author of Lady's Almanac, again 1928, which was quite a year. Um, and that's the lesbian satire, which features Radcliffe Hall, among many other contemporary lesbians. But being produced in Paris in a small edition, Juna Barnes actually sold it on the street like a pamphlet. It, it may not have registered with most English readers in the 1930s in the context of Chase, but it, it was a cult hit. Um, I just briefly mentioned a couple of other texts of the same period. Molly Keane's 1934 novel, Devoted Ladies, um, has the same stock characters, the wicked mannish lesbian Jessica and her victim lover, Jane. And Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca in 1938. Uh, the sinister housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, is a sort of lesbian by implication. I'm sure everybody remembers the bit in the film with the creepy bit where she's fingering Rebecca's underwear. And, um, and finally, I think we must mention Vita Sackville West, not only the inspiration for Orlando, but a lesbian also herself, of course. Um, her poetry book, King's Daughter, 1929, uh, according to her husband, 
had unwisely lesbian poems in it for that year of censorship. Uh, but many of her novels are on lesbian themes, but they're often disguised by gender switching. She usually represents herself as the male character. Um, but The Dark Island, 1934, also published by the Hogarth Press, is interesting because it's a, it's a popular melodrama, contemporary melodrama, like The Well. And it contains a relationship between two women, which certainly looks queer to us. But um, perhaps it was safe from official sanction because they die at the end, um, which is an outcome that was to become very familiar to readers of lesbian fiction in later decades. So I think it looks like in this context, the Chase the Wild Goose is an interesting crossover because the first part could be read as a sort of queered version of a fairly typical romantic historical novel of the period, which it sort of avoids the dangers of explicit eroticism, but it emphasizes the love. So it's brave, but at the same time, it's publishable and careful in a way. But in the last section where the ladies meet the author in that extraordinary moment of time traveling, traveling biography, it's a surprising escape into the fantastical world of literary weirdness and it takes a lot more risks. And I think perhaps that's what made the book of interest to Virginia Woolf and the Hogarth Press. Thank you very much. Uh, that's fascinating. I mean, that, that whole period, the first few decades of, of the 20th century is just fascinating um, in relation to lesbian history. Um, picking up on, on the whole language thing, I mean, throughout history, language used to describe LGBTQ plus people has been disguised. Um, and we often have to read between the lines. So how does Gordon handle this in Chase of the Wild Goose? And Diane, can we start with you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think with the book um, itself, I think it's just, I don't, I don't think she shies away from the fact that they were maybe not necessarily um, sexual lovers, but they had a very strong, uh, they had a romantic life together. So I think she doesn't necessarily, she doesn't disguise anything. I think she's very confident in her portrayal of, of their relationship. Um, and she's very clear, certainly in the in the final part of the book, in saying that she sees them as as foremothers. You know, you paved the way for us, for the people who came afterwards. You know, you are our foremothers. So I think she's quite explicit in that sense of of, of saying that, you know, because they existed, we can exist. And I think um, she doesn't use. Um, in fact, she pushes back against the the terminology, the kind of the sexological terminology of the day. Um, and, and refuses it, um, but um, I think she's very clear that she is claiming them for um, her generation in the present. So I think Alison, though, I think Alison could could perhaps talk a bit more about the the, the historical terminology um, in a more eloquent way. I think um, not to, to pass the the baton too quickly. <laughs> well, I'm kind of interested in the way that Mary Gordon. Well, I mean, clearly it was wise to sit on the fence, as it were, but she is, I think, genuine, you know, she really, really is quite um, ambiguous about the nature of their relationship. On the one hand, as you say, DM, she explicitly kind of places them outside of the sexological idea of inversion, because at one point she describes how their family friend, a Miss Goddard, um, who had described Miss Butler as having a debauched mind. This is when the two women were trying to run away together. Um, but later on, Miss Goddard forgot that Miss Butler had a debauched mind and defended her by maintaining the, roman the romantic friendship theory, which is obviously what Mary Gordon is wanting to do in the book. And Gordon goes on, and since no terrible scientific names were in existence to describe phenomena of the kind, the escapade remained romantic. So I think she's explicitly kind of um, placing the ladies outside of, well, yeah, a kind of Havelock Ellis sexological view of them as being categorised in a particular way as inverts, which was the um, contemporary name for lesbians, although lesbian was sort of coming in, coming in as a t as terminology in the 
well, among some groups of people anyway, in the 30s and 40s. Um, but at the same time, yeah, as you say, she she casts it as a kind of as she casts them as spiritual forerunners. So she um talks about them as as kind of having yeah she talks about them as being in the spiritual company or of many unknown women entirely unconscious pioneers into another epoch so she's kind of drawing on other psychological ideas which is the Jungian stuff in seeing them as these sort of spiritual forerunners and as really important to women's same-sex love and kind of still leaving it open I think as you know is it love or is it sexual or is it all of those things and what I find interesting about Mary Gordon is on the one hand yes yeah, she's tried to negotiate the 1930s and all the stuff that's coming down the line and more explicit discussion of of homosexuality but she's also herself um a new woman in the late 19th century sense. She trained, she was one of the early women doctors. She fought hard. She struggled with her family to get educated and trained as a doctor. And then she was the first um, woman um, as a prison inspector of, of women's prisons and, and women inmates. And, and she was also a suffragist. So she was, you know, incredibly, um, um, a, a, Kind of aligns her her own life with with the struggle for women's emancipation, and of course, as a young woman in the late nineteenth century and early twentieth century, she was involved in all those networks of suffragists and new women, many of whom had relationships with other women, and some of them certainly by the suffrage period, we know they were sexual relationships that others were 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 not oh she was also she also worked for the scottish women's hospital didn't she in the ambulance service in the first world war and again that was a kind of full of a network of of women who were identified um as you know enjoying same-sex love and also as as you know not seeing heterosexual marriage as at all important to them so she comes out of that period of time um but yeah, she's moving into the 20s and 30s. And, and as a doctor is all kind of a well aware of all these different strands of, of psychological, medical and sexological thinking. And is, you know, trying to steer a course between all those, I think. Thank you. Um, Francis? Can I, just, can I just read a bit from the book, though, just to give the audience a flavour of just the, the kind of the tone of the book in case they haven't read it, just the sure. bit where if you don't mind, Francis, um, when when Sarah first um, kind of cut gets her eyes on when she first sees Eleanor, the kind of the meat cute of the book, because it gives you a sense of how um, Gordon's figuring this this queer gaze, this this queer identity, uh, circulating this queer identification between between women and and celebrating it in 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 quite a sweet, playful, um, joyful way. So this is Sarah seeing Eleanor. She went to the window to look outside but drew back as she saw a young woman crossing the lawn in the direction of the entrance door. She looked after the young woman with curiosity. She was hatless. She had a rosy face, blue eyes and fair thick hair, which curled like her own. She was strong and active. She wore unusual shoes, thick and square, such as boys wore. She was smiling and talking to an enthusiastic, enthusiastic puppy, which had rushed to greet her. Then the glimpse of her was gone. Um, and then a bit later, um, Eleanor enters the room to, to, to find Sarah. Um, and she says, um, I'm very glad to see Miss Ponsonby, replied Eleanor. If I had known she was to be here, I shouldn't have gone out. She took Sarah's hand in a warm, firm clasp and smiled sincerely into her eyes. In her soft Irish voice, she spoke again. No question, but that we shall be friends. We are friends already, said Eleanor Butler. Where, Sarah asked herself, was this eccentric handful that was Miss Butler? She could never have existed. This woman was charming, gracious, kind. Sarah's smile did not fall off this time, but in speechless response to the other's words, she flushed delicately all over her pale face. So, I mean, I appreciate it's kind of, it's romantic, it's very vanilla, it's very sweet, but I think it gives you a sense of um, the first half of the book anyway, of how um, Mary Gordon is figuring their relationship. Thank you very much.
um Francis yeah I think that's I think that's true and I completely agree with you that it that it comes across as very much like a, a romantic historical novel um and as you say it's kind of quite sweet and quite and quite soft but I also do agree with Alison that there is a kind of um part of the reading between the lines thing is that is that she she doesn't really go in for that to talk very much about it although she says she calls it ardent love um she doesn't she, there isn't anything explicit um and i also thought it was interesting that quite a lot of the time she she seems to be defending them against imputations of scandal and you know the debauched mind thing and and i felt that that was an interesting um, paradox that what is she defending them against the, the suggestions that they're lesbians well they are lesbians uh, apparently so what's the problem you know it, it does seem to uh, I think that is part of the as you say that the, the fact that you have to read between the lines I also thought it was quite interesting um that at the bit at the end when they're having the discussion and she's telling them all about women don't have to marry now and um, there are these marvelous new ways that they don't have to have lots of children, even if they have married. Um, and the ladies are all very interested in all of that. Um, but then um, at, the, at the very, very end, um, when um, it's uh, Sarah Puntonby, I think, uh, says to her, and you, have you no one? And she says, to call me beloved, to go with me, no one. I thank you for your sweet concern. But one must not quarrel with one's own share of the price of our freedom. And that sounds, it, that's very new woman, isn't it? It's, 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 it's that she's made these sacrifices so that she can be a doctor, a prison inspector, have an independent life. Um, so she might obviously feel that she couldn't have married um, at, at the time of, of her youth and, and had that sort of life. But again, she she doesn't have a woman who's her significant other in whatever whatever way her lover or her partner does she uh, uh, in the book. Alison, you're about to say something interesting. <laughs> I can see it's bursting out of you. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is interesting that, isn't it? Because she's certainly aligning herself with the vision of the ladies as you know this impossible or or very difficult to obtain. Um, ongoing love relationship which you know she and many other women aspire to and she's kind of yeah I mean as you say I think she's she's see she's seeing she's kind of evoking this notion of the new woman or the suffrage feminist who and remember that they they kind of try to elevate spinsterhood away from the idea of sort of something lost or never you know nothing you know uh, of of marriage having you know been um ha having not managed to get married into something more positive mm -hmm. but um i mean within that was often a lot you know a, um quite a, a widespread experience of love between women and we don't i mean we, we we have these sort of snippets of mary gordon's life but it does seem that she did have in the past, in her past, um, a relationship with a woman which had broken up in around 1922, which she regretted the breakup. Um, I mean, in 1922, I mean, Mary Gordon herself was about 60. So, and you know, when she see, visits the ladies as ghosts, she's in her mid seventies. Um, so we got, we have these sort of snippets from letters between her and other women doctor friends. So it seems there was somebody who may have been a partner. I mean, I wouldn't want to sort of say it more strongly than that, who was nicknamed, a woman who was nicknamed Frank. And, you know, Frank and she had clearly had some separation, which was, you know, quite painful some years earlier, which she had been discussing with her, another woman friend who knew them. So. So it's a kind of lost love narrative, but we don't really, we can, again, it's, you know, we can only read that between the lines because she paid places so much store by the fact that the lady's relationship lasted for over decades and decades. And yeah, that they were icons, not just as lesbians, but as this 
lesbian couple, or at least as a a, 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 a couple who whose love had had persisted. Very, yeah. Thank you. It is absolutely fascinating how she 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 writes about them, um, and certainly in, at the end, she seems to ally by, very much with them because she says Eleanor starts when she sees her because she she sort of thinks she looks like Sarah. Um, very quickly, because we kind of um, getting running a little bit out of time. Um, and those of you who want to put questions in, uh, we're about to go to uh, Q and A. So please do put your questions in the box below. But just very quickly, um, the last chapter in in Chase of the Wild Goose. Um, Gordon was very interested in spiritualism and, and mediums, and, and it's reflected in that last chapter when she meets the ghost. Some like that chapter, others don't. Do you like that that particular part, DM? Yeah, absolutely love it. I mean, I think it's it's amazing. Um, like going into the fourth dimension, which is the the kind of classic, um, from what I understand, the kind of nineteen uh, twenties, nineteen thirties kind of spiritual reference to to kind of queer alternative um time spaces where you can time travel or travel somewhere where you can interact with with queer life in a in a seamless way and uh, connect with the four mothers and the possibilities of of different kinds of queer existences um it's it's an amazing it's a remarkable piece of writing the first time i read it i couldn't quite believe it i've read it countless times now and i'm still I, I still struggle to to make sense of it just because she plays it so straight. Um, she, she is completely artless in some respect. It's so literal, but it's so artful. Um, and it's like it's artlessness totally masks the fact that she's, you know, she's talking about a dream. It's a it's a dream. She actually says I'm um, it's not really a ghost. I think that's the connection to the young, um, the Jungian connection, because she had been um, studying with Carl and Emma Young, and the book is dedicated to, to Emma Young, Young, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, so she says, you know, that at once I, I took this, this dream took me to, um, to Plasnara, to, Lan to Glan Gochlan. Um, so she, she st states very explicitly that it is a dream, um, but because it's played so straight, it's so literal, you almost miss it, I think. Um, and it, it seems, She's so serious and she recounts this experience of going for a walk on this this bright, clear day um, and, and sees the ladies. Um, and again, as you were saying, in the likeness of, of Sarah Ponsonby, Eleanor sees her as the likeness of, of Sarah. And yeah, I just I just love it. And I think it's it, it's so it's so progressive and um, kind of resonates with a lot of contemporary queer thinking around um, about time travel and, and temporality um so it's 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 very contemporary and i think it's it's a, a piece of writing that that really i think people will connect with um and deserves to be widely read i think the main body of the book deserves to be widely read because it's it's just a really nice rendering of a, of a lovely story but i think the end part just gives it a whole a whole new level so yeah big fan of the end thank you very much francis your thoughts yeah, well, I, I thought it was great as well. I, I mean, I actually thought that it, um, it transforms the book uh, into, as you say, a rather simple and straightforward retelling of the story, you know, fictionalised um, into something altogether weirder and stranger. And um, I thought that it was an interesting commentary on the nature of biography, the way the biographer imagines the people until they become so real to them that they can actually speak to them, meet them. And the idea that it's a sort of two way traffic, um, that the biographer can do something for those people in the, as well as the other way around. Um, I also very much like the connection with Radcliffe Paul because of course she was a notorious spiritualist. Um, she sued one of the committee from the Society of Psychical Research for libel. And one, because they basically called her a lesbian, which I think is quite funny. This happened before the Well of Laniness trial. Um, and she was a huge believer, which, and which I'm sure Gordon must have known, um, and published a paper on her own experiences um, with the medium getting elaborate messages from her dead lover, Mabel Batten. And um, Terry Castle, um, in her brilliant book, Kindred Spirits, 
suggests that Neil Coward's friendship with Radcliffe Hall actually inspired his play Blythe Spirit, um, and that Madame Arcati, the medium, is a not very coded lesbian. And I felt that had a very strong connection with all of this spiritualism um, dream world and, and the queering of that whole big spiritualist fashion during the 20s and 30s. So I thought it was great. Thank you. Alison, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's interesting. When I read reread the book, it's it seems that in places Mary Gordon is also representing Sarah Ponsonby as a bit of a mystic, that she's she she's kind of um slightly otherworldly in, in, in various respects. And she's when she meets the ladies as ghosts she talks about them dreaming us into existence and then she's dreaming of them so yeah i mean i <laughs> i suppose if we're sort of trying to look at factual history then we wouldn't have much truck with ghosts but you know i i really love the notion of queer heritage and where whenever we're in a building or a place that has so many layers of queer history you know we're, we're imagining the LGBTQ people who've lived there in the past. So we are bringing them into our present day lives, if not quite so um, imaginatively or, 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 or materially almost as Mary Gordon does when she really meets the ladies and then, you know, has this arrangement to meet them again in the house in the next day. Um, so I think it kind of, yeah, for me, it really resonates with the idea of queer heritage that, you know, we're, we're constantly ourselves creating ghosts and ideas of the past. And that's, you know, that's true of us as historians and we, we should acknowledge that. And we're, you know, we're contributing to that, to, to that as well. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, imagining our forerunners as, as, both like ourselves, but also is very different. You know, she has to bring them up to speed with women's emancipation. is is really, really amazing. So I, yeah, I like the ending. I think there's a lot of a lot of mileage in it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, and also, I mean, the, the changes that have gone through the uh, plus now with itself. I mean, the, the black and white building that we're also familiar with now was not yeah. the one they lived in. So there's, you know, there's whole sort of um, sort of echoes from the past in that as well. Um, so, yes, please do put your questions. So uh, I've got a question from Caroline. Uh, please. What is the origin and significant the significance of the Mary Gordon title, Chase of the Wild Goose? How does it relate to the real life story of the ladies of Longotlan? I'm intrigued to try and uncover any relation between the ladies and the reference to the wild goose made in the earlier Virginia uh, Woolf novel, Orlando. And I think we covered, Francis, I think you covered that slightly. Um, do, you, do you want to say anything on that, please? Um, yeah, the, it's, the, the, it's a, on the last page of Orlando, um, the, the wild goose, um, uh, the wild goose feather falls. Um, as Shelmerdine, now grown a fine sea captain, hale, fresh coloured and alert, leapt to the ground, there sprung up over his head a single wild bird. It is the goose, Orlando cried, the wild goose. And the twelfth stroke of midnight sounded, the twelfth stroke of midnight, Thursday, the 11th of October, 1928. The last words of Orlando. Um, and the significance of the wild goose is somewhat mystical. Um, and I think it connects to the idea of creativity. Um, it's interesting, Valentine Ackland, uh, when she talked about the inspiration behind poems, would say that it was a feather from a bird that had fallen, which, which she caught and it became a poem. So I think that connects with that. Um, but somebody was, I was talking about the title, somebody else recently, who told me that there's um, a very famous Irish patriotic ballad. Now, this isn't my specialisation, um, which is called The Chase of the Earls of Kildare, um, who were also known as the Wild Geese. So I don't know if anybody else knows more about that than I do, but I think that may be a connection as well. There's, there's also a reference to uh, a horse race. 
uh, whether the chase of the wild goose, the wild goose was supposed to be the leader of the horse race that was very erratic and you had to try and, and uh, follow the, the, the leader. DM, can you, can you shed any more light on the title? Um, no, I don't think so. But I mean, I, I always thought it connected to the, the the sense of flight as well, that they were on a journey, that the ladies were on a journey, that they were escaping from their um, from their homeland into to, to Clangothlan. So I think it I always, you know, that they were taking flight and, you know, flying off somewhere. So I think I think it's I think that the connection to Orlando is is probably very deliberate. It's where where Orlando ends. This is where the story is picked up so um i don't you know she, it was published by hogarth press i don't think it's any coincidence that she is mary gordon used that imagery in in the title so yeah but it's, but it's an odd but it's odd in a way isn't it because a wild goose chase is, yeah. is um is chasing after something illusory hmm. yeah well yeah it's unsuccessful you know but isn't that yeah? Isn't that the, the sense it's of the queer, that, history, no. the, the queer history, the elusiveness of it as well? I think mm. maybe that we're we're chasing it. She's you know she's chasing it. She's trying to find it. Um, and the, the thing about the ending, just to go back to the ending, it is actually very sad because you get the sense of Mary Gordon being alone, and maybe that's the narrator rather than Mary Gordon being alone because there's also the bust that was created in her likeness with them. Um, I've forgotten her name now. Her, there was her Violet, Violet Labuschagne. Violet, yes. Um, I don't know what their relationship was, but um, she, yeah, that that seemed there's quite a sort of putting yourself in 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 the the church in Kangochlin, this bust of uh, the ladies of Kangochlin in Mary Gordon and Violet, like putting yourself in stone with another woman in the place of Sarah and Eleanor. It seems a very strong gesture in the church you know <laughs> let's go in the church so that's a it's a remark and that's the 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 stone buster actually is the poster for this event so um yeah so i'm not sure what their relationship was but um yeah i think you do get the sense at the end of her life she's she's dealing with all of all of that business all of that this is part of her the business that she's dealing with telling this story um but yeah there's a there's a sense of of, of indebtedness and of, of, of being alone and I think you know to, to have the conviction and you know probably the obsession really to do all that research to tell that history I think maybe it was a a wild goose chase for her as well and it you know following all the leads and all the stories so yeah but I think most likely the Orlando connection is a very tangible um tangible one Alison. Do you know about the sculpture, Norina? I do, yes, yes. Um, I mean, some people have said that when you study the faces, they do have more resemblance to Mary Gordon, but there are not any images of Violet, so we, we don't know what she looked like. Um, but, yes, yeah, certainly a lot of people have said that the um, resemblance is more to Mary Gordon and, and Violet. Um, Alison, any thoughts on the title? No, I don't have anything to add to to um, <laughs> my. Okay, uh, Jess has asked, um, "How accurate uh, is Gordon's account of their escape?" Do you have, do you want to start? That Maybe off? Alison, as the historian, should answer this one. Um, dealing with okay, the accuracy. Alison? Well, I probably can't give you a very um, precise answer on that. I I think. Um, some of it, I mean, as, as I understand it, she drew on the Hamwood papers, which are actual letters um, of from the Ponsonby family, or no, maybe, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, Elizabeth Maver's original book about the ladies, which was published in the 1970s and has since been reprinted, is, prob you know, is, prob is, is certainly a kind of... <laughs> usefully accurate um, account of, of their history. I mean, my feeling is that she, you know, some of it was accurate, but she embellished such a lot of it. And some of it is taken verbatim from letters and other bits of it are, you know, made up to become, yeah, a, a kind of uh, a romance. And, and also, I mean, just to sort of pick up on something we were discussing, you know, a few minutes ago, there's a bit in it, isn't there, where I think, again, Miss Goddard, who kind of is 
you know, good guy and bad guy some of the time, um, when she's kind of trying to warn Sarah off Eleanor, um, says something to her, and I'm paraphrasing here because I haven't got the book in front of me. Um, so Gordon has her say her, um, to Sarah, oh, well, you know, she. what happens if you go away together? Anything might happen. Why, she might even make love to you. And Sarah said something like, oh, well, that would be... <laughs> smiles and said oh well, that would be rather wonderful or words to that effect so you know she's kind of putting she's she's I suppose she's illuminating the history the, some of the some of it's factual and some of it is not but she's illuminating the facts with 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 emotional feeling and her imagine imaginative um, notion of of what of what she would have had them say and feel and do. I mean, a lot of it also is written in contemporary language, like language of the 20s and 30s, or possibly even language of Mary Gordon's youth. You know, some of it kind of recalls them all being at, as if they were kind of undergraduates at, in, at university coffee parties and stuff. So it's, yeah, it, it switches between, you know, these different kinds of, different tones so I wouldn't take it as historically accurate I think if you want an accurate um, version of the elopement then I think you know look at Maver's account which is based on a range of sources but you know it's 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 not complete you know it, it, it is based on the facts the fact that you know they they got away the second time and there were these negotiations with the family of which, of course, nobody can know what was actually said in rooms between Sarah and her guardians and her and, and so on. So, yeah. Um, and of course, Mava would have had um, access to many more sources than than Gordon in the 1930s. Yes, yeah. yes, she did. And, you know, she did some 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 good research into into those sources. And, and just to say that the Tracy Spottiswood, Spottiswood's made a fantastic short film called um, when, when Sally Jumped Out the Window, which is a, a short film about the escape of the ladies of Klangoff, of, uh, you know, Sarah and Eleanor. And it's a really a, a brilliant rendering of that, of that story. And it's, <laughs> yeah, I think it's such a rich, a rich theme to, to, to explore. Um, I think, yeah, I'm amazed that more people have a, <laughs> haven't um explored this this narrative because the, the escape in itself is is just an extraordinary um thing to have happened and of course lots of people later on wrote books about about them which also made up lots of stories about the elopement yeah the jumping over walls breaking legs and things which were not true but i mean all of these sources kind of have made the myth of the ladies and the and kind of ex have has have pointed to the enormity of what they did you know two extremely well-born young youngish women um eloping together which was pretty amazing in the late 18th century it certainly deserves a feature film yes yeah. <laughs> or, or a tv series like Ernest. francis did you want to add anything yeah i was just thinking um about the authenticity um that I think it says in the very interesting afterwards of the book um, that uh, Leonard Wolfe was a little bit concerned about was it fiction or was it a biography? How factual was it? Um, and that um, Mary Gordon sort of made clear that it was based on fact, but that she, I think she says she's added in some poetry. Um, it's just her way of saying she sort of fictionalized the conversation, as you say, in a slightly slightly uh, and it's not really it's not 18th century pastiche at all is it it's much more um much more 30s style but I also thought it's quite interesting because again uh as in the she wants to defend their honor um she also seems to almost want to suggest that the most um exciting aspects of the of of the running away of the elopement um the the, the pistol the being dressed in men's clothes and so on that that she doesn't really use that all that much. Um, she's kind of toning down the gentleman Jack part of it uh, because it's a bit unladylike, and um, and she doesn't and and she talks about the scandal and rumor and says there are lots of untrue stories about it. 
um, which again I think is rather sweet. Really, it, it's not very um, it's not very commercially minded, is it? To sort of try and you know make soup it up as much as she can. She's doing the opposite and, and being like, oh no no no, it was all agreed and they went nicely and got a bit of a cold perhaps, but you know that's as far as it went. Sorry, well, part of the outrage, sorry, um, part of the outrage though of, of, of the book, and I think part of the impetus of her writing it was to write against the Hamwood Papers, wasn't it? Yeah. So I think she was trying to pre present a counter representation that was more that centered their agency um, and their decision to elope together. So I think that's I think that's part of the the, the narrative that she was pushing back against um, in the book to to try and you know tell the story as they would have said it. And perhaps that's what the end part of the novel is about as well, with uh, yeah. you know, trying to revive that voice. I, th I think we're, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, sadly. <laughs> I, could, I could go on chatting all evening. There's so many things that I wanted to cover and chat about further. But sadly, we, we have come to the end. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much to our three speakers who were brilliant. Um, Dion Withers, Alison Oram and Francis Bingham. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and um, I hope we do another one very soon. And buy the book, buy the book. <laughs> <laughs>